Yes, welcome uh, to our penultimate Sunday seminary. Uh, we got one more left after this, uh, this week. If you've missed any of them, first, uh, shame on you. Uh, second, they are all online, uh, except for last week's for some reason. My mom let me know about that. Um, she's very supportive, uh, so she watches us from distance. Um, but uh, they're all online. They're all at, uh, at the PCBC uh, uh, YouTube channel. So you can go and find them there. Just type in Sunday Seminary PCBC on YouTube, and you'll find uh, whichever ones you've missed uh, there. So uh, do you want to talk about signing in? Yeah. Yeah. So just for you, you know, at this point, those of you who've been here multiple times, you're like rolling your eyes because we already do this. But if you haven't, please sign in uh, in the back for your on your way out. And um, we... Oh, yeah. And then just a reminder, again, because we're getting to the end of this, this is flowing into a connect group called Seeking Understanding. And um, we will have more details about that tomorrow or tomorrow, <laughs> next Sunday, about where we're meeting and everything. I think it's going to be in the same place that we were. But uh, we would love to join you and talk to you if you would be interested in that. There's no pressure. If you're already in a connect group, that's great. But if you'd be interested to come join a growing community of people who want to talk about these things, we would love to have anybody, anybody there. There's no pressure, but everybody's doing it. Yes. It'll start, it, well, it's already actually started. We took a break for these eight weeks, and then it'll start back again, I guess, what, April uh, 10th? Week, but the week after. So April, I think next week is April 3rd, so April 10th. Yeah, so Palm yeah. Sunday. Palm Sunday. Um, okay, so one thing on a personal note, and I wanted to say thank you to y'all and to uh, the, the Seeking Understanding Connect group. So uh, Kim, a couple weeks ago, had her uh, comprehensive written exams for her PhD. And what are we? Are no, we, I'm just surprised. I didn't know this was coming. Surprised. Hello. Uh, and she has to pass those to uh, get her PhD. And so um, we were shooting for like three out of four. I kept telling her, like, you get three out of four, you can then retake <laughs> the fourth one. And she passed all four of them. Um, so I'm very proud of my wife. And she, uh, these were like six hour exams, 10 pages, single spaced, three questions each, something like that. It was very intense. Uh, so thank you to all of you. This has actually been a great help mm -hmm. to her uh, in being able to do that. And the other thing that it's really helped with is she has her oral exams on Thursday. So two hours where professors are just grilling you on theological matters. And this has been really helpful as well for her just to be able to be in front of people and get used to that. Uh, so thank you to all of you. Please continue to pray uh, for her because after that it's just dissertation. And, um, and then we can be done. <laughs> Just the dissertation, yeah. <laughs> you can tell I don't have a doctorate because I'm like, that's eh, just a dissertation. So, um, so I'm looking forward to being uh, Dr. and Mr. Travis Cook. It's going to be great. Um, so today we are looking at the millennium. Uh, so the, the, the way we're going to break it down this week is uh, pre, right? Pre-millennial, post-millennial, and then amillennial. And then the fourth position that's lesser known is the willennium which Will Smith brought in with getting jiggy with it. Um, so we won't talk about that one today. That was only relevant for some of the audience. I got a good chuckle. Right <laughs> Thank you. And it was worth it. The joy on that Jamie appreciated face. it too. <laughs> um, so that's what we're doing. And then lastly, we are going to, we're going to pray and then we're going to read Revelation 20 and then we're going to get started. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for your word, thank you for your grace, and thank you for your goodness, Lord God. We praise you, Lord, that we're able to discuss these things freely, and we're able to um, open up your word and just consider the great God who loves us to share himself with us. So I pray you'd bless our discussion, Lord. Guide us as we talk about your word, and it's in your son's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to slide over here because we're going to talk about premillennialism. Uh, also, uh, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, there's a great book. There's actually a series of these books called Counterpoints, and they basically get evangelical authors, and they write articles and then respond to each other. This one's called Three Views on the Millennium and Beyond. I don't know what the and beyond part is because it's largely the millennium, but if you're interested, uh, there's a whole series of these books. They've got like the law and the gospel. They've got the, the rapture positions. They've got revelation. They've got, they got everything that you could have um, on there. So uh, check that out if you're interested in more. Uh, it's at a scholarly level, which is, shouldn't be too intimidating if you've sat through, uh, through these. You can hang with that. It's just a lot of scripture references, and uh, it's really, really good. 
So let's talk about the millennium. Let's start by reading Revelation 20, uh, verses 1 to 10. It's that top one there. John says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. I love how clear he is, like four different descriptors. And bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw the thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years were ended, Satan was will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is God's word. Okay, so let's talk about the different positions uh, that we have here. I'm going to set this aside for just a second. Just don't have a big enough. Uh, so we're talking about premillennialism first. So where the positions get their name from, millennium, is the thousand years. Okay, so thousand years, millennium, everybody knows that, but I wanted to be real clear. Uh, so there are essentially three views. Uh, there's what's called premillennialism, which believes that the thousand years takes place uh, before Christ's return. Uh, there is the post-millennial position, which is Christ's reign takes place, or Christ's return takes place after uh, the thousand years. And then there is amillennialism, which just doesn't believe in a literal thousand years, and we'll talk about what that means later. So I'm talking about premillennialism, and I'm going to hand it off to Kim for postmillennialism, and then we're going to come back and talk about amillennialism. So with premillennialism, there are essentially two brands. There's like a classical view that some church fathers held, and then there's a more uh, recent version of this. Uh, the classical view was started by Irenaeus, and basically what he believed is that the present state that we're in, so the world we live in now, will, uh, will endure for 6,000 years, okay? And then there will be a 7,000 year that will be uh, the millennium reign. So do you see what's going on here? Six thousands and then a seventh kind of day-ish of rest. He's kind of emulating the, uh, the, the six days of creation, seventh day of rest. And this will be preceded by the gospel going out to all nations. Uh, Israel will be converted. Uh, so the, the, the Jews in large numbers will come to know Christ. There will be apostasy and tribulation. And then there will be uh, some dark times preceding it. Uh, and largely these folks will have a post, and we'll get into this, a post-tribulation view of the rapture. I don't know of anybody that still holds this. Uh, maybe somebody does. Um, it's a pretty classical view, um, and it's, it's pretty allegorical as well uh, with the, the six, uh, six days, thousand days, whatever. But then there's a more modern view, and this is probably the one you're more familiar with. This is probably the one that many of you believe or grew up believing, uh, and that's great. It's a legitimate view. Um, so it started largely in the 19th century, at least really pushing for it, in the 19th century, and it's become entangled with a, a hermeneutical system called dispensationalism, of which many of you would know, especially if you went or had anything to do with Dallas Theological Seminary, you know about uh, dispensationalism. I'm not going to get too much into that. Uh, but in this view, Israel is a leading player. And so the, the way in which it's, it's taken is that God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament, will be literally fulfilled to Israel and that the church is kind of a, a different animal, right? So there's, there's sort of this separation between Israel and the church. The Bible is divided into the book of the kingdom, the Old Testament, and the book of the church, the New Testament, and the kingdom, as we said, is sort of separated from the church. The kingdom is something that's largely promised uh, to, to the Jewish people. Uh, and so in the premillennial position, there's two comings, there's two arrivals of the Lord. There's the first one that happens before 
the tribulation or before the, the millennium happens. And that's when Christ calls the, the people, uh, his people to himself. They're raptured. You've heard that, this word raptured. Uh, they, they're taken out of the world and they're allowed to uh, reign with they, they get out of the tribulation in some way, shape or form. And uh, then the second coming of Christ, or, or, or I guess in this case, it's the third coming, uh, is when he arrives and actually sets up a new heaven and a new earth. Does this make sense at all? Is this, there's like you're tracking? Again, I know it's, it's, it's a little convoluted. So what is the millennium in this position? That's kind of what we're focusing on today. What is the millennium in this position? Uh, so Christ returns uh, a second time. So there's his first advent when he is born as a baby. He arrives sort of to rapture everyone out uh, that are believers. And then his final return uh, is at the end of seven years of tribulation and the earth is judged. This is what we just read. Uh, Satan is, is, is kind of bound and, and trapped the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. And the millennium is a real kingdom. In this view, the millennium is a real kingdom on earth that is a material kingdom of the Jews. It is Israel that's always supposed to be. It's, it's Israel like Israel was supposed to be. There's a, a, a theocratic king uh, who will be like David. You've known him. Uh, his name is Jesus. He'll be the Davidic king. Uh, the saints will be rulers with Jesus here as well, and Jews will be natural citizens, Gentiles will be adopted, and Jerusalem is the center of worship. The temple will be rebuilt, it'll be on Zion, and sacrifices, sin offerings will be made again. Now at this point, there's some questions you might have about, wait a minute, sin offerings, does that mean people are, are sinning in this state? And this is where, uh, where, where the millennium uh, becomes a little bit like you, we've, we've got to fill in some blanks uh, together. So there will still be sin, but it just will not be as devastating as it has been in the past. Now, it will not be the glorified saints, the people that were raptured out, will not be the ones committing these sins. They've been glorified, they've been resurrected, they've been changed, and we'll talk about that. But remember, there's seven years of tribulation. There's seven years where, uh, where, where people are still here. And during those seven years, people are still coming to Christ. So the, the belief within the premillennial position is there will essentially be, I don't want to say two classes, but two kinds of Christians. There will be those who were raptured out and have been glorified and changed and transformed and are in their eternal state, but they're on earth. And then there will be those who came to know Christ during the tribulation at some point, perhaps even because of the tribulation, and they will not be changed. They'll be like we are now. And so there's these two kind of classes of Christians. Now, they'll live longer. There will still be death, but they will live longer. Now, again, the glorified Christians will not die. But this other group of people, they will, they will live longer, but they'll still die. They will still have kids. There will be generations and all this. Again, over a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, uh, as it says here, sorry, the, the world is converted but not glorified. At the end of the thousand years, Satan's loosed. He assembles the armies against Christ. That's the Gog and Magog uh, story there. And they're obliterated with fire, and Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Now, a lot of this is based on, as I said, a literal interpretation of the Old Testament. That is key. Uh, now, everybody, every single view here will say that they literally interpret Scripture. Okay? So nobody's going to be like, well, we don't literally interpret Scripture. Everybody uh, in the evangelical world uh, kind of flies that flag, right? Everybody wants to literally interpret scripture. Uh, but for example, look there at Isaiah 65, 20 and 25. It's the next verse there. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So what's that saying is, if you die at a hundred, you cons you're considered to die young. That's a, that's a young death, right? The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Okay, so the way that the premillennialist is interpreting that passage is they're saying that's the millennium. That's the way the thousand years will be. That's, the, that's the, the, a, a great picture of what the thousand, people are still dying, but they're living longer. The effects of sin and death are not as great, and the, the earth is in some ways 
uh, restored. Now, there's a lot of strength to this position. Obviously, like interpreting things literally and, and is great. Obviously, it does a great job with Revelation 20. I mean, it, 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 it looks at Revelation 20 and it's like, okay, it says there's going to be a thousand year reign, literal thousand year reign. You can go through, there's this first resurrection, there's a second resurrection, all that makes sense. Ties up a lot of knots. There are some weaknesses. Again, if we're going to literally interpret scripture, and you're going to use that, that sort of method throughout the Old Testament, you've got to literally interpret everything. So there's a bunch of nations that are mentioned in end times prophecies. Gog and Magog would be one of them. You've got Egypt, you've got Assyria, you've got Babylon, you've got Edom, you've got Moab, all mentioned in prophecies that are end times prophecies. So that means, if we're going to do a literal interpretation, that those nations are going to have to either A, rise to power again, like Egypt, which is not a world player right now, still a country, but not a world player. And then some of these empires that haven't existed for thousands of years, like Assyria and Edom, are going to have to come back. Right? And again, that's, that's not necessarily a flaw, but it's, it's one of those things where you're like, okay, we're going to literally interpret things. Um, when this view reads kingdom, so whenever they read kingdom, Old Testament, New Testament, they are literally reading the kingdom as this theocratic Israelite kingdom. Uh, and, and so Jesus intended, and, and again, this is a, a minority, probably not a minority, this is a sliver of the people that hold this view. Jesus intended to set up a literal kingdom of the Jews when he arrived on earth in his first advent, but because he was rejected by the Jews, he went away and is going to come back and set up the literal kingdom in the thousand years. So uh, before we go forward into the rapture positions, which is a key part of millennialism, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Don't know how you don't. Yeah, we'll talk about. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that with the rapture positions. Yes. Because it's a good, it's a good thought. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 A new heaven and new earth after the thousand year reign. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to get into the rapture. Oh, yes, sir. What's the point of the thousand years if we're all just supposed to end up in heaven at the end anyway? So that's a great question. Um, it's a great question. Uh, there's an element of that wh that I will allow my wife to answer as a premillennial holder herself. Um, what I would say is one of those things is like God giving more opportunity for people to come to repentance. God is slow. He's patient. On the other hand, uh, like all things in scripture is designed for God's glory. And so if you hold to that position in some way, shape or form that on, uh, I don't know that I understand that gives God more glory. That would be my, my answer. I don't know. Logically, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite able to answer your question there. Would you like to? Well, I mean, no, I think, I think what you answered is good as far as why. Obviously, we, uh, the, the key with this position is the attempt to make sense of, like in a literal way, to make sense of what is in revelation and apocalyptic literature overall and so that's where sometimes things seem a little wonky <laughs> where you're like what are you why why are there all these returns and that kind of thing and and that's fair and that's why there are these other positions that kind of smooth over that whereas this position says no we really want to hold to what scripture literally says and so you start having some hoops and stuff to jump through and so they're trying to account for what you see in Revelation 20. Like, okay, so it says that there's this thousand year reign. So, you know, whether or not I think that that makes sense, that's what God says there will be. And so that's why we hold to that. That would be w what they would respond with. Yes, sir. Right. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and so Satan is bound for, for part of that. That's a big point. And we'll get into more of Satan being bound when we talk about amillennialism uh, because that's a, a key point that they kind of, the amillennialists kind of go after premillennialists and kind of be like, this is, 
there's other places that talk about the binding of Satan. So we'll talk about that. Let's talk about the rapture position. Um, so there's, there's essentially three rapture positions. Uh, and this is why people, whenever they teach this, they have charts. I'm really wishing I had like a whiteboard or something. Um, there's pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, and then those of us who can't make up our minds land in the mid-tribulation rapture position. Just kidding. It's a, it's a great, great idea. All right, so seven years. Scripture talks about seven years. And so this is after Jesus, like after the rapture, or I'm sorry. Okay, okay, I'll stop okay. interrupting you, my bad. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you for your help. I was trying to like put it like, like we already Yes, about. yes. So, so this is trying to figure out, if you hold to a premillennial position, this is trying to figure out when do Christians leave in, re- in, in reference to the seven-year period that's talked about in Scripture, talked about in Revelation, where things get really bad. So this is when the Antichrist has a lot of power. This is when, um, this, it, go read Left Behind, and it will tell you everything you need to know about the tribulation. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a narrative. So the, the three views are pre-tribulation. Before the seven years even starts, Christians are gone, sucked up into heaven. You're driving your car. It's the bumper sticker you've seen, warning in case of rapture, vehicle will be unmanned. That is, that's that position. The post-tribulation rapture holds that after the seven years are over, they will, will, will go to meet Jesus in the air and then establish the millennium. And then there's the mid-tribulation. And the reason why they ch- pick a midpoint is because apparently for three and a half years of this tribulation, things are really, really good. And then for three and a half years, things get really, really bad. And so the idea is that, that Christians are, are avoiding the bad part. So let's talk about this. The pre-tribulation position, um, because it's incredibly difficult, any kind of trial mankind goes through will actually get turned up a notch. So anything you can think of, wars, famines, dictatorships, pestilence, evil, sickness, whatever you can think of that's bad about being on earth right now, it gets way worse in the tribulation. That's what it is. So Christ will come back before the tribulation begins to retrieve the church. It's not going to be a secret. No unbeliever, uh, sorry, it will be in secret. Uh, No unbeliever will see the arrival of Christ at this point. They'll see the Christians leave, but they won't see, like, again, people just disappear. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. That's the large passage where they draw that from. There's two comings of Christ, three resurrections. Okay, here we go, three resurrections. Ready? There's the rapture resurrection. There's the resurrection of those who died in the tribulation. And then there's the final resurrection of of everyone and unbelievers. So three different resurrections in this position. Um... The argument against it is that Matthew 24, which uh, we'll dive into Matthew 24 quite a bit, um, is that Matthew 24 talks a lot about the elect being under a lot of end time tribulation. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later. Uh, The response from the pre-tribulation position is that those are Jewish Christians, not um, church Christians, I guess. Um, And the tribulation is God's reestablishment of his relationship with the Jews. Um, There's two judgments. uh, The church gets judged at the rapture, and then there's another one. So pre-tribulation, rapture, basically everybody who is a Christian right now avoids the tribulation and goes to meet Jesus in the air. The post-tribulation position is that they believe that Christ will come for the church after the end of the tribulation. Okay? They don't use the word rapture because it isn't a biblical word. Um, it's not a literal seven years. There's also not a literal thousand years. I'm not sure why they hold that. And the church will experience the suffering. Now, this is important. The reason why anybody holds to a rapture position is because of what it says in Romans 8, verse 1. What's Romans 8, 1? There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because Christ has absorbed the wrath of God on the cross... Those who hold to a millennial, a premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture position is that, hey, we're not subject to wrath, and the tribulation is God's wrath on the world, so we, don't, we shouldn't have to deal with that. We get out of that uh, based on uh, the First Thessalonians passage. The post-trib position says that Christians will not be subject to wrath during the tribulation, 
but instead they'll be subject to suffering at the hands of unbelievers. So remember in the, in the Exodus story where some of the plagues don't hit the region that Israel is in, like darkness, there's only light there, they don't have it to deal with a lot of the things going on. That's essentially what will happen in this view in the post-tribulation uh, rapture position. They'll say, wherever Christians are, everything's fine. They don't have to deal with those issues, which will incur a lot of animosity and anger from the non-Christians around them being like, well, why do you guys get out of this? And there'll be persecution based out of that. Um, and then there's the mid-tribulation position. There's actually a lot of these. I didn't realize this until I started looking at it. There's a bunch of different varieties of these, um, but essentially the, the, they all revolve around the idea that the Christians will be present for the, uh, the good part and will leave uh, at the bad part uh, before that gets started. Any other, uh, any questions about, yes? Not always. So if you hold to a rapture, you have to hold to a premillennial position. So if you hold to a rapture, you're a premillennialist. If you are not a premillennialist, you don't worry about a rapture because you, you're, not, you're not dealing with um, Christ setting up a kingdom and at all. You're not dealing with the thousand years being a literal on earth, literal thousand year reign of Jesus in person on earth. Postmillennialism deals with it a little bit differently. Amillennialism obviously doesn't have to deal with it. So when you, chew, when, you, when you say, okay, I believe in a literal thousand year reign, you then move into a second set where you're like, okay, I've got to decide what happens to Christians prior to that. And so that's, that's the answer here, pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. Yes, that, that Christ's return, Christ. Um, Christ, uh, sorry, help me out here because I always get this confused. Christ's return happens before the millennium. Yes, Christ's return happens before the millennium, therefore it's pre-millennial. That's where the term comes from. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, because of the literal view of Scripture, uh, and I was having this conversation earlier, um, Daniel is seen as a, as a helpful tool to help understand what's going on in Revelation 20. Um, and, and so they're, 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 they're using that to help interpret and understand Revelation 20 as well. Great question. How do they get around the fact that everybody will know Christ returns? Uh, there's verses that say that when they're saying that Christ's return is a secret. It is a, um, th their answer would be like Christ's final return would be the one that is very evident and prevalent and everyone sees it, him coming with the clouds. Uh, that's, the, that's the method. So I actually don't like, even though I, I wrote it this where I, I put my notes this way, is largely because of the resources I used. I don't like the idea that they, that, that people describe it as multiple, like, second, third, fourth comings of Christ. I don't think that does justice. I think what you're talking about is these are, uh, the rapture, the, the millennium arrival, all of that is Christ's second coming, and it's all under one, <coughs> one heading, rather than saying, okay, this is his third coming, this is his fourth, I, I, I don't think that's helpful. And I, and I think, if I can say this, uh, I think for a premillennial to defend their position that way, I, I think it does them harm to defend their position that way. I think it's better to look at it and say, this is all the second coming of Christ, and it's not this like one, they're, 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 they're stages of it, but it's all the arrival of the kingdom. In the same way that we would say Christ's first advent wasn't just his birth. His first advent was his entire 33 years on earth. That's his first advent there's, there's, th that's the way I would describe it, uh, because I, I don't think it's, I just don't think it's helpful. Rob.
Yeah, no, I, I, it's not a deception thing. It's a, it's a, it's trying to make sense of the text uh, that that's in a, that's in existence. And and again, like there is a passage in Revelation twenty that says there's a literal thousand year reign of Christ, and so we do have to do something with that. And we'll we'll talk more about that. I'm gonna hand it over for post millennialism because I think I've gone past my time. But that one's like easy. Yes, okay. it's got a lot of subsets. Premillennialism is tough. All right, so post-millennialism, shifting a bit. So again, just keeping in mind that when you're talking about pre and post and all millennial, you're actually talking about the return of Christ. The return of Christ is before the millennium. The return of Christ is after the millennium. Or the return of Christ is currently happening. He can explain all millennialism. I don't know. Um, uh, so post-millennialism is the belief that that Christ's return will be after a, <laughs> it's not a literal thousand year, and we'll get into that, but after a period of essentially flourishing and abundance and peace that seems to be described, um, uh, the millennium seems to be described as. So, but what's important to start off with it are, I have, there's three core beliefs of a post-millennialist. And these are important for understanding and doing justice to them. And we'll get into it. Sometimes they're kind of disregarded. And I think that it is a legitimate view. So I'll get there in a second. Okay, so the first core belief is that they have an expectation in the movement of the gospel. And so they expect that the spirit, not humanity, not our human efforts, but they expect that the spirit will move and push the gospel throughout the entire world and that the majority of humanity will be converted to Christianity eventually and that that is a very slow gradual process it's not something that's going to happen immediately it's a very long process so the, again I just want to reiterate and this is where it gets kind of swept away like what you know swatted away like a fly um where people are like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> or either that it's naive or that, um, like, that's just an overconfidence in humanity. Like, that puts all the pressure on us. We're the ones who bring Jesus, you know, Jesus' second coming. And that, that's not being fair to them. They believe that it is Christ's work, and they believe that it is through the Spirit. And Christ is the one doing it. And as we, uh, the people of God— choose to evangelize and try to increase and, and move the gospel throughout the world, we're participating in that effort. But it is not dependent necessarily on us for Christ to return, which is sometimes the caricature of this view. Alex. Um, a, a, yeah, a sense of a determinism. Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, I think it would be more, so, not to go too far off a rabbit trail with that, but um, there are two ways that you can look at how uh, God interacts with the world and with occurrences. One of them is called monergism, which is a more deterministic uh, view that like he, so mon, one, he, God is the only one moving things. So that's a heavily deterministic view that, that there are some people, especially in the more reformed traditions, that would definitely hold to that. Um, we were laughing. There's a blog from a reformed theologian called monergism, like dot com. Um, so there are definitely people who would hold to that. I hesitate to go, personally, I hesitate to go that far because of what scripture says. It seems like there are, there is an element of accountability and responsibility that God places on us, which, which would take you in some measure, and it's a spectrum, but would take you into the other option, which is synergism, that somehow God and us work together. This is not us, like, like saving ourselves. It's not us bringing Jesus back. Like I said, it, it's God working, 
but God chooses to work with us. And so I think, I, I think that's a fair question with regard to this view. God is choosing to work through people. It is his work, but it's also dependent on his people. And like, like they believe, it is a slow, gradual, and this is actually the next core belief. So the expectation of the movement and the next core belief is that it is a gradual millennial kingdom. So as the gospel is moving throughout the world and, you know, people are changing their lives and societies are changing because of their belief uh, in the Lord and because of the movement of the Spirit through them. And, you know, I mean, just like it has might hopefully has happened in your own life. You know, as you become more surrendered to the Lord, hopefully you have a more righteous life. And so eventually the hope is that it would be more righteous societies and then eventually it just goes all the way throughout the world. That is the, that is the millennium in their view. So they do not hold to a thousand years. Um, it, they have a symbolic and allegorical interpretation of Revelation 20 that, um, that sees it as, okay, it's this, however long it is. And then once all of that happens, uh, there will be an extended period of time that we all just kind of enjoy that. <laughs> And, and in that way, Christ is reigning because the whole world, earth is more or less, I mean, I, I don't think that they would say every single person. Most of the time, they don't get, theologians aren't going to go that, that specifically most of the time. <laughs> They're like the majority. So the, the idea is that for an extended period of time, Christ is reigning through his body, the church, through God's people in this long time of abundance and flourishing that kind of thing. So expectation of the movement of the gospel, gradual millennial kingdom. Um, I want to just be really clear. We are not talking about, and we, it, Travis mentioned it earlier, but we, this is, don't get this confused with the eternal kingdom. So it's really easy to get it confused with the eternal kingdom. I was even getting it confused as I was doing this. I was like, oh yeah, you know, and then forever. And I was like, oh no, 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 we're talking about the millennium. So this is separate. This is all before like it it goes into the eternal kingdom which all before Christ returns yes all right so the third view, the third important belief the third like core thing to understand post millennialism is that the second return of Christ will come after all of that happens so the expectation that the gospel will move through the world the the millenn the um mo- there will be a gradual millennial kingdom and then an extended period once that has all happened and then Christ will have his second return and do the judgment and everything we'll talk about next week and then it'll be the eternal kingdom, which we talked about last week. All right, any questions on the core beliefs? I'm going to talk about how they, how they get there in a second, but any questions as far as understanding what they believe? Right. Yes, Nick. N- I don't believe so. No, there's no tribulation here because g- there is. Okay, well then I don't. I m- I missed that. It, yeah, it's like what we're in right now, right? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a literal seven-year tribulation. So, any other questions? That's what I was like, I, don't, I really don't think there is. <laughs> I think it would be what we're doing, yeah, in the movement of the gospel. Okay. All right, defense. Okay, so I have defense of those beliefs, but let's be nicer and say this is how they get there. Um, all right, so biblically how they get there is they see uh, Genesis 3.15, at the crushing of the serpent's head, they see that as evidenced or as kind of the guiding thought that Christ's first coming crushed the serpent's head and that the results are being slowly worked out over time. So that's how they understand Genesis 3.15. And then Romans 4.13 uh, talks about Abraham being the heir of the world. And so they hear heir of the world and they think that's, that's everybody, that's everything. So that's the whole world that Abraham 
like that Abraham and the Abrahamic line of redemption in scripture is referencing the whole world. So that's how I, those are just some overarching narratives. And then they have specific passages that they point to that they seem to, that say, they say, seem to indicate a salvation for all of humanity. So they really love the Messianic Psalms. <laughs> um, one version, like one, I only included one. There's a whole list. But uh, Psalm twenty two twenty seven. it says, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Uh, Isaiah 2, 2 through 4 talks about, um, it's a description of the last days and all of the nations flocking toward the mountain of the Lord. And so it, and it's very clear that it's all. So they see these passages in the Old Testament, and they also see them in the New Testament. So you, um, Matthew 13, which I didn't include there because it's an entire chapter, uh, with the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven and the, the leaven working its way through, they see that as, again, this idea of gradual growth and gradual change that will happen because you know, the mustard seed would be gradually growing and the leaven gradually makes its way through the bread. So, uh, and then John 12, 31 to 32, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, but I, this is Jesus speaking, obviously, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. So they see those passages and they say, this has to be it has to mean something. And so they're, just like the premillennialists, they have chosen a different set of passages <laughs> to take literally and say, well, because of these passages, we need to really hold this and try to come to understand the millennium and the end times in light of these passages. And this is how they more or less have worked that out. Church history. Um, so that's their biblical defense, church history. There are no creeds or anything that affirm any millennial position. So it's all, nobody knows. I'm, I'm glad that they didn't try to, <laughs> I'm glad that they didn't put it in there. <laughs> or maybe I'm not, I wish they had. Um, but uh, there are a lot of confessions, which we can talk later, the difference between a creed and a confession. But there are a lot of confessions uh, that lean toward post-millennialism, actually. So Lutheranism, Presbyterianism, a lot of the Reformed tradition, are grounded in this view. So it has a very strong historical precedent. Uh, it goes all the way back to Origen, in, who died in 254 AD. Eusebius, Athanasius, and Augustine even really seem to have this view. So it, that, I mean, anytime you throw Augustine out, that's a pretty big deal in theological circles. So it should be taken seriously. Uh, and then even later on, John Owen, Isaac Watts, the Wesleys, Jonathan Edwards, and even John Calvin all held to this, a version of this position. So again, those are big names. Um, the general, uh, oh, okay. And then the last thing is you can historically, if you look at history, there does seem to be some sense of a general t trend of flourishing through human history. So if we look back, you know, and we, we talk about the caveman times or, you know, however you want to do, like, that early part of hum human history. But, and, and there was a lot of poverty. There was a lot, you know, of war and anger and, like, all those kinds of things. But especially the poverty, specifically, and slavery and that kind of thing. It does seem as if there is less, nobody is saying that there is none, does seem overall that there is less human suffering now than there was back then. I'm just saying what they say. I'm not saying I agree with it. <laughs> I'm getting a raised eyebrow from my husband. Um, and so that way, the overall trajectory of the human state does seem to potentially support this too, and that that's part of the movement of the gospel and the part of the restoration of the world. There are different brands of this. There's um, an evangelical brand, so they would believe pretty much most of what, what we believe, but they just hold to this specific view. Uh, there, it, this view kind of 
gets a little bit of a twist in, you guys may have heard of Christian Reconstructionism. You may not have, um, but it is a movement that believes that the spread of the gospel will turn the societies back to a practicing, uh, like a practice of the Mosaic uh, judicial laws. So they believe, they look at this and they say, as that happens, as the gospel is moving, it will actually all end up looking like the Mosaic law. That's how the societies will be turned. Um, it's, that's their view. But it, there are, it's even, there was a Christianity Today article about this like a couple months ago. So it's very much a thing, but it was uh, largely a thing in about the 70s. That's kind of when it started. And then finally, um, if you make all of this less spiritual, if you make the gospel less spiritual, then you make the spiritual, that you make the kingdom less spiritual. So does that make sense? So for, I'm sorry, I'm being confusing. So for liberal theologians, we've talked a lot about them and I've tried to introduce you to their approach a bit. So in this instance, the movement of the gospel, if the gospel is, I'm sorry, if it's more spiritual and it's not really like, Jesus Christ dying on the cross, and that's what the gospel, you know, in the resurrection and believing in him. If that's not the gospel, but it's really kind of more of this ethical peace and ethical kingdom, brotherhood of all mankind, fatherhood of God, that explains your spiritual experience. If that's really kind of what's moving through the world, then it, the millennium will look more like um, just that ethical like the social gospel, this is the social gospel, <laughs> the social gospel movement. So that like it, the, um, the spread of the gospel is like the spread of ethics basically. And that peace and that kind of thing will reign, but it won't be because Christ is at the core of it. It will be because, because it's just, I don't know. How would you say it? Yeah. People, people develop a Judeo-Christian ethic. Uh, yeah. Ethic. That's a good one. Okay. So, any questions about that? Good, because we don't have much time. <laughs> Go ahead. And that, and that is one of the main arguments against them, actually, is, okay, maybe there's more, yeah, there, maybe there's more prospering, maybe. You know, people say, arguably, okay, let's even assume that the world is not getting more Christian. And that, that's one of the big arguments against them. So, well done. Yeah, post-millennialism <laughs> took, a, took a big hit, took several big hits in the 20th century. Uh, with World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, uh, proliferation of nuclear armament, that doesn't seem to be getting better. Um, and in, in our current society, you look at things like climate change and uh, the racial structure, racial, racial issues we've had, and, and, and all of that, like, it doesn't seem to be getting better. And that's why we introduce to you today the amillennial position. Yeah. What's that? Yes, it was. Uh, it's, a, it's a segue. It's not a commercial. Um, so there are those who believe that there's no millennium at all, which makes it really difficult uh, to explain. Uh, so I will, I will challenge you. Uh, does, do you have any atheist friends? Any atheist friends? Uh, go ask your atheist friend. Atheist literally means, doesn't like A means no. Theist means deity, right? So no God. Go ask them to describe what they believe about God. They will look at you. Like you're out of your mind because how do you describe something that you don't believe in? So here we are with the millennials trying to describe what they believe about something that they don't believe exists. So here we are, right? Uh, so uh, amillennialists believe that there is no intermediary state between what we are currently experiencing and the new heaven and the new earth. So the next time you see Jesus, if, if you see him on earth, uh, he will be establishing the new heaven and the new earth. So there's no uh, intermediary thing. 
the millennium, for those who hold to a millennial position, is seen as a period when there will be worldwide peace and righteousness on earth before the new heaven and the new earth. An amillennialist does not hold. There won't be that period. Instead, they believe that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of Satan are kind of growing alongside one another until the return of Christ, right? There will be then the return of Christ. There's the resurrection, then there's eternal judgment, and then there's the perfect new heaven and new earth. The present experience of the kingdom will be immediately followed by a full consummated kingdom. Um, so uh, it's an eternal kingdom. It's not a temporal kingdom, uh, like we talked about with premillennialism. Uh, and if you enter into this kingdom, then you are glorified, transformed. It's how you will always be. There's not going to be two separate classes of people and then a final resurrection, none of that. It's, 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 it's one very, uh, it's very clean uh, from this to that, right? Does that make sense? It's, 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 again, it's, it's difficult. Um, amillennials, amillennials see no scriptural evidence for a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus. Now, that's hard when you look at Revelation 20 because you're like, well, that seems like a, a lot of, like, there seems some verses there, uh, Travis. Um, a thousand years in Scripture, for an amillennialist, they would say, that's, that's a big number, and big numbers in Scripture tend to not be that accurate, is what an amillennialist would say. They would say that when you look at seven years of tribulation, if you've heard seven in the Bible, right, typically means completion, it's a perfect number. Thousand's another one of those that implies completion and perfect number. So they would say seven years of tribulation doesn't mean a literal seven years. What it means is there will be a time of tribulation that'll have some prosperity, some not prosperity, and it, when it comes to a completion, which would be seven years completed, then there'll be the return of Christ. The, millenn the amillennial would also say a thousand years means an indeterminate amount of time. There's a lot of similarities between the amillennialist and the postmillennialist. In fact, in the book, uh, The Three Views on the Millennium, it's funny to watch the postmillennialist and the amillennialist respond to each other because like, their first paragraph is like, I think Chuck did a great job with this. I just have a couple of nitpicky things. And then the premillennialist gets there and is like, is like ready to fight everybody, uh, which is super fun uh, to read. Again, I just made it sound a lot cooler than it actually is in the book. Um, so there's a, the, the thousand year reign, uh, or the thousand years in Revelation 20, uh, is just takes place between the two advents of Jesus. So his first coming that we celebrate at Christmas and his second coming, uh, which is yet to come. So the big thing, and we can, we can do this a, a lot, there hasn't been a lot of writing from amillennialists over uh, the course of church history. And the reason for this is because what do you write about when you don't believe in something, right? Uh, I don't write a lot about unicorns because I don't believe in them. Um, but uh, amillennialists started writing a lot more when premillennialism pre pre took off in the 19th century. So you see a lot of uh, debate between the two camps. The big one that they kind of key in on is the binding of Satan. So you'll see in Revelation 20 there that we, that we read in the beginning, it talks about... Um, he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So what they do is they key in on that and they say, okay, let's talk about the binding of Satan, right? Um, so Matthew 12, 28 to 29, Jesus is speaking and he says, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then indeed he may plunder his house? What he's saying is that word bind there is the same word, same Greek word in Revelation 20 for bound. And what Jesus is saying is, according to the amillennialist, is the strong man is Satan and he's had his run of things, but now that Christ is here, Satan is bound. He's restricted from his activities. He's not stopped. He's just bound. He's, don't think of bound as... as as imprisoned, think of bound more as um, restricted by God's will. Uh, notice what it says here. Um, where is it? it talks about him um, not being able to deceive the nations, deceive the, the Gentiles uh, anymore. Uh, verse, uh, sorry, John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of the world, and now will the ruler of this world be cast out. So again, he's talking about Satan there in John chapter 12. In uh, Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them 
in him. Again, he's talking about the rulers and principalities, Satan and his forces being restricted in their activity. Um, for the amillennialists, the binding of Satan happened at the crucifixion and resurrection. Satan is still active, but he is bound. You'll see there I had Jude 6 on there. Uh, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now that sounds like, wow, okay. Like, it sounds like those angels are not allowed to work. That, that sounds pretty restrictive. But we know that's not the case because Paul talks about in other places, especially Ephesians 6, the struggle that we have with the angels and the demons and, the, and all of that spiritual warfare component. Um, so that's what the amillennialist would say. Uh, many amillennials view the disembodied saints as the ones ruling and reigning with Christ in heaven. So you notice it says, um, I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge had been committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Those are uh, the Christians who have died but have not yet been glorified or resurrected. They're reigning now. So if you have loved ones that died in Christ, they're currently reigning and ruling with Christ now um, as they await for the, um, the new heaven and the new earth. Um, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Uh, this is the first resurrection. The first resurrection being... Uh, those who are alive, those who are believers in Christ are spiritually alive. Now, those who are not believers in Christ are, are dead and spiritually uh, dead, right? So, uh, some parts of amillennialism sound like postmillennialism, and it's easy to get the two confused. I do. Um, the big difference is a postmillennialist will say the world is getting better and better and better in all facets. An amillennialist will say, no, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, there are big passages, Luke 17, uh, 34 to 35, which I don't have on there. Sorry, Matthew 24. You can do Matthew 24, verse 6. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Be famines and earthquakes in various places. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. So the amillennialist takes that and says, no, things are going to get worse. The world's going to become more antagonistic towards believers and then Christ will return and uh, rescue us, deliver us from, from these things. So, who has a question about... And I, just to follow up on that, just to be clear, the amillennialist and the postmillennialist post would agree on the interpretation of Revelation 20. So they had, like he said, the only difference is whether it's getting better or worse, but they actually have the same interpretation. It's like when you go to the optometrist and it's like, one, two, better, worse, better, worse. That's what it's like. Post-millennial, I'm millennial. Uh, Luke 17 to 34. Luke 17, 34 to 35 is another one. I didn't like that one as much as the Matthew 24 one. I like Luke, though. It's my favorite gospel. Fun fact. Maybe you could quickly address in like a minute why this matters. Why does this matter? Great question. No idea. Um, why does the millennium matter? Well, one, it's scripture, and it talks about it. So we should be invested in scripture. We should read scripture. And a lot of people's approach to Revelation, especially if you've ever heard sermons on Revelation, is let's preach about the seven churches in the very beginning of Revelation, and then let's preach Revelation 21 and ignore the rest of the book because we don't understand it. Um, I, thankfully, this is not our church. Our church did a series on Revelation, like, I want to say two years ago, uh, which was a lot of fun to do. Um, but it's a part of God's word, and it's supposed to be instructive, and it's supposed to be encouraging. And however you understand the millennium, God is in control. God is sovereign. God is reigning and ruling over things, and he has a plan and a purpose. And whether you understand the plan or purpose or not, maybe there's a fourth view other than the millennium that, that, that we don't even know or understand, and that's what God's actually doing. We could be way off here. But the good news is, like, again, you don't have to have the right view of the millennium to participate. So if I'm wrong about the premillennial, pre-trib, post-trib, whatever, it's not like God's going to be like, oh, sorry, Travis. You thought it was a mid-trib thing, and it's a pre-trib. Sorry, you've got to wait three years to get raptured because that's, that's not how it works. So you can be dead wrong about the millennium. I mean dead wrong. And still get to participate in what God's plan has 
And that's our gracious God. Praise God. So that's why it matters. Because we want to know more about what God's revealed about himself, even if it doesn't make sense. Which, which uh, sir, what was your name again? Caleb. Caleb here has a great point. Like, why? Like, why do we have, like, this thousand year and then this and that? Again, I'm on the logic train here, and I'm with you. And I'm like, I, I understand it doesn't make a lot of sense. But sometimes God's plans don't make sense. He had a guy march, he had an army march around a city seven times to make it fall down. Like, that doesn't make military sense. <laughs> but it worked. And so there are some things that God does that don't make sense to us, but they make sense to him. And we need to trust in his, uh, his authority that way. Questions? Yes, sir. No, you're good. Good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we talked a little about that a little bit with the views of Revelation. Um, and so, you know, if, if you can go back and listen to that. But essentially, like, he's trying to encourage the believers that are undergoing persecution that at some point Christ will return and, and set things right. Or he's saying that these are, um, Satan is already bound and so this is restricted. Uh, he's trying to help them understand what it is they're going through in a cosmic spiritual conflict sort of sense would be my short answer and a much longer answer there, but that would be the shorter one. Other questions? We're a little over. I don't want to keep anybody, but I will because I have a microphone. All right. If you have any other questions, you can come and talk to us. Thank you for hanging with us. Again, I know it's super confusing. Uh, next week, we're talking about hell and judgment. So I'm going to dress in my best three-piece suit. We're going to turn off the air conditioning, and I'm going to get my sweaty Baptist preacher rag, and we're going to have a good time. Have a great week. If you have questions, you come up and talk to us. Take care.